very good to be with you this evening. I want to thank you for another invitation to come here and be a part of this very important work. I want to thank the elders here for uh, deciding to put this work together and all the sacrifice that's gone into this. I want to thank um, those who put me up for dinner this evening. I was very enjoyable and I enjoyed your hospitality and I certainly appreciate it. If you're here visiting from the community, um, I think I can speak on behalf of the congregation in saying you are certainly welcome. You're our honored guest. And what we want to do here this evening, as we have been doing throughout this week, is to appeal to God's holy and divine word for our instruction. If we're not doing that, then what are we doing here? Our Bibles are for a purpose, and if we're not turning in those pages, then we might as well not even call ourselves Christians. And so that's what we're going to do here this evening as the theme for this scripture, um, for this, this series of sermons appeals to the authority in the scripture. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And it is my hope and prayer that we fulfill that obligation this evening. I'm confident that we'll do so. In my studies, I have appealed to God's word for the truth. As was stated, and as we have scheduled, we're going to be looking at the concept of women preachers this evening. And this is a touchy subject, as Brother Fight mentioned, um, with the movement starting long ago and reaching to the point it has right now in this nation specifically. Women are always wanting to prove themselves and gain power. And when we talk about this subject in regard to spiritual things, often the topic is misdirected. And I want to make sure that we look at the problem this evening in light of what the scripture says regarding that subject. In a second, we're going to look at a few things that we're not going to address this evening. Many things which individuals will bring up in that argument, which brings our minds away from the scripture. And the things that are argued about Paul never even comes close to implying, nor do the other apostles or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at that topic this evening. And with the evolution of this growth of women participation in various institutions, even in government, we remember in 1920s, the 19th Amendment was ratified that allowed women to vote. And those rights have grown, and many things that are good have come from this. We're not denying that women would have the part to play as a citizen in this country, and certainly aren't denying that they have a role to play even in the church. But we're asking the question, what is that role? What we need to understand is the government does not decide what a woman's role is, not only in the church, but in creation. The government plays a role and it is in authority set there by God. But we need to always follow God first and foremost. When the government steps in our way, we must serve God rather than men as Peter and the other apostles did so aptly in the New Testament in the book of Acts. And when there are things that become legalized or accepted by the culture and society, that does not mean that it is authorized by our Lord. So that's what we're wanting to look at this evening. Are women preachers authorized? And why was there not a woman invited to participate in this lectureship as a speaker? Was it because there was no one that showed interest? Or was it because there was an acknowledged decision not to invite a woman to this lectureship? And I suggest to you, as you all know, that that is, in fact, what happened we're going to look at that this evening. Some things that are not under consideration so that we make sure we're on the same page. What is the argument this evening and what is not the argument this evening? Because Paul is very clear on the subject. And he's very clear about what he's not talking about because it's not there. We're not talking about whether women are appreciated and valued. We see their value in scriptures. In Genesis, the second chapter, and in verse 18, when God created man, 
He said, it is not good that man should be alone, so I will make him a helper comparable to him. Man was created and there was an emptiness, a deficiency there within that role that had not been fulfilled with regard to woman. And God saw it fit to give him a helper. That was in his design before the time began and it was in fulfillment when Eve was created after Adam. The writer of Proverbs mentions a virtuous woman in the 31st chapter of that book of wisdom. And he talks about a virtuous wife. Her worth is far above rubies. And that is true for a wife, and it is also true with women in general. They are very valued, even in the Lord's church, certainly in creation. We're not talking about whether or not a woman can do as good a job as a man. I stand before you humbly, understanding that there are women in the world, and very well may be, and probably is, women in the assembly tonight that would have more talent than me as a public speaker. That's not what we're considering this evening. We're not considering whether a woman is inferior to a man. And we'll touch on that more specifically as we go along. We're not discussing whether or not they know their Bibles better than men. Many women know their Bibles better than some men. And same with men and women. Perhaps even some children know their Bibles better than some men sadly to say. We're not discussing whether or not a woman can teach another woman or a child. In Titus, the second chapter, Titus is exhorted to tell the older woman to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish who? The young women to love their husbands, to love their children. A woman has that perspective and experience as an individual who has gone through that motherhood and being a wife that can give an insight a man cannot, that is very valuable and that is encouraged and commanded of older women and the younger women to look to the older women for instruction. In 2 Timothy, the first chapter and in the third chapter, the Apostle Paul writes to that, that young preacher Timothy and reminds him that he was taught those scriptures from being a child by his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and that he should not only remember what he was taught, but remember who taught him. There is a value there with them and an ability that they had on, on Paul or on Timothy, an effect on him as a man of God. We're not questioning whether or not a woman can be a servant and serve. As a Christian, Phoebe in Romans, the 16th chapter in verses one through two was commended by Paul. And he told those brethren and Rome to accept her and to help her and encourage her. She was a servant, but I suggest to you that she was a servant within her divine limitations. We'll touch on that as well. And we're not questioning whether or not a woman can correct a man in humility, again, within her limitations. As we see, Apollos was teaching the word of God, but did not know it to the full extent of the doctrine of Christ, still teaching that baptism of John, not knowing fully yet the word of God. So you had Aquila and Priscilla who taught him and explained to him more fully the word of God. But what is under consideration? As we had in the title of the lesson, women preachers authorized or not. A verse that I'm sure we're all hearing time and time again this week. Colossians, the third chapter and in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you say, whatever action you take, do it all in the name of the Lord. He is the one who has the preeminence. And he is the one whom we must submit ourselves to in everything including who's in the pulpit preaching the word of God amongst men and women assembled. And in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and in verse 11, we're going to see the Apostle Paul address this subject of women and their role not only in the church, but in creation. He says in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, 
but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. A matter of creation and the order of creation, a matter of transgression determined that the woman was to be in silence, not to have authority over a man or to teach over a man, which is that position of authority. She was to be submissive and she was to be silent, not just discussing the specific woman Eve, but women in general. You'll notice there, it says, Adam was not deceived, but not Eve, the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And we'll talk late, later more on that subject. But many will look at this scripture. And because it's written by Paul, I guess it's because the words are not written in red, although the Gospels are also written by a man who is inspired, not written by the very hand of Christ, that these things must not apply simply because Paul must have been a misogynist. And this is a conclusion reached simply by an aversion for what he said in those specific texts. Because I guarantee you, some who read 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12 and say Paul must have been a terrible man, one who hated women, will turn to 1 Corinthians the 13th chapter and romanticize that section of Scripture discussing love and accept every single word that the Apostle Paul has to say. And so there's an inconsistency here with regard to that. And Paul's writing is rejected by those who want to accept women preachers and encourage women to take that role of being a preacher. And this is certainly a, a threat to the church externally, as we even see and was probably addressed last night with regard to the homosexual agenda that's going to be something that is threatening us from the outside, but I suggest to you this is also a threat from within. Christians wanting to go toward this side and evolve with society, changing what they think the Word of God teaches. And we can't do this. And the Apostle Paul's writing must be accepted. And we're going to look at that. The Apostle Paul, in many places, appeals to his apostleship and has to defend his apostleship even in the first century. There were those who were false apostles and those who understood the apostle Paul not to have been walking in person with the Lord in his ministry those three years on earth. But that as he was one born out of due time, they rejected him as an apostle and he had to argue that point many times. But I suggest to you even to this day, some individuals, they will reject his writings as being the oracles of God. And that cannot be true, for Paul was an apostle. Galatians, the first chapter, and in verse 1, tells us such, as well as Ephesians chapter 1, and in verse 1, and many other places. Starting out his epistle, his letter to men and churches, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He was one who was to be a witness of Christ's resurrection, Acts, the first chapter, and in verse 8, they would be witnesses to all who are in the world of Christ and His resurrection. Something pertinent to our salvation and to the gospel of Christ. Everywhere He went, He preached Christ and Him crucified and raised again, reigning on the right hand of the throne of God. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, and beginning in verse 18, we see another facet of the apostleship that the Paul had in his ministry as well as the other chosen men. Jesus said there, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Notice that I have commanded you, and I'm with you always even to the end of the age. They were to make disciples, and to make disciples there had to be that power of God into salvation. Romans, the first chapter, and verse 16. The gospel of Christ had to be preached. Those things which Christ uttered to them and those things which they were taught later on had to be taught in their ministry and, in fact, were the words of Christ. It was by the will of God that the apostle Paul received this office of apostleship. It was not a usurped position. And so the apostle Paul is not speaking on his own self-proclaimed authority or opinion, 
but it is Jesus that chose him and appointed him. Galatians, the second chapter, in verses 7 through 9, also discuss other individuals who were apostles and understood and agreed upon to be inspired men in the first century by those whom they addressed and to those whom they wrote epistles. And they recognized Paul as well. In verse 7 of Galatians 2, the scripture says, On the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, notice, had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter, that's Christ, for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And notice here, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, that is the appointment of being an apostle, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. If an individual wants to reject part of Paul's writing, they have to reject all of Paul's writing. And if they reject all of Paul's writing in turn, they have to reject the rest of the apostles' writing because they recognized him as an ambassador of the Lord, as one who came in the presence of those whom he taught to not teach his own opinion, not teach his own law, but teach the law of Christ. And in fact, Peter wrote about this in his second epistle, appealing to the authority that was given Paul he said in verse 15, Consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. 2 Peter 3, 15. Notice, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, not attained by study and copious amounts of, of, of evidence that he compiled himself, but wisdom given to him, he has written to you, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. Notice, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote, he wrote Scripture. He wrote the inspired Word. And in that same chapter of 2 Peter, chapter 3, in verse 2, in discussing this problem with the scoffers of that time who were saying and questioning the second coming of Christ, where is His coming? He said he was going to stir up their pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Understanding these individuals, they know those individuals are inspired. They understand their authority. They understand that's the word of God. And on the same plane, he sets the commandments of us, he says, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And we know in the first chapter, he mentioned that holy word of the prophets, which was in fact not of a man's origin, but was divinely given as men moved by the Holy Spirit. We see all of those levels. It's the same plane of thought. The apostles' doctrine, the doctrine taught with regard to the prophecies. They're both inspired. They're both from God. In Galatians, the first chapter, and in verse 11... Paul put it very plainly. He says, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. But notice here, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. It was not from men that he received this truth about the women's role in creation and in the church. He didn't receive it from someone else. He didn't conjure it up in his own mind. It was not an arbitrary decision made by Paul because he was bitter toward women. It was a decision made by God in creation, in his purpose that he determined in the quiet chambers of eternity that always was and always will be with regard to what he says 
1 Corinthians the 11th chapter and in verse 23, the Apostle Paul points to this establishment, institution of the Lord's Supper. This was done when Jesus was still on earth before his death in the upper room with those whom were chosen, Paul not being one of those few at this time. And yet he talks about how the Lord revealed it to him, how he received from the Lord these things concerning the Lord's Supper, and He's delivering it to them. And He knew this because Jesus revealed it to Him as an ambassador of His. But how was this, and how did this happen? What is the process? We remember in Matthew, the 28th chapter, and in verse 20, our Lord told them as He commissioned them to go and make disciples and preach the word and baptize individuals and teach them the things he had commanded them. That he is going to be with them always, even to the end of the age. Yet we know good and well that the Lord Jesus, after he was raised 40 days later, ascended on high, never to come back to earth until that appointed time, never to die again, never to be on earth as a man, for he had fulfilled his ministry and so how would he be with the apostles? I want you to turn over with me to John the 14th chapter to answer this very important question. John chapter 14, as he's discussing things with the disciples there in John 14, he mentions in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. That helper is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He will be with them, not in physical appearance, but through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the helper that would guide them into all truth, the comforter that would be with them when he left. These men he would not leave up to their own opinions, up to their own abilities to decipher what the Lord's will is. Man can't do that. We cannot know the things of God unless we know the mind of God, unless we have the Spirit which dwells in Him. 1 Corinthians the second chapter. And so the apostles say we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 16. Because Christ is still with them, dwelling with them by inspiration, of the Holy Spirit given to them as was promised by our Lord. In John, the 16th chapter, in verse 12, Jesus rather explains why this helper would be given to these individuals. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, every facet of of the gospel of Christ, the things they had been given explicitly, directly by Jesus in his own breath on earth as a man, they would be reminded of and they would be teaching that to others. But he did not tell them everything. And so they're going to know everything because of the helper. He will guide you into all truth. Notice he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will make, take of mine and declare it to you. Notice he says he'll glorify me. How will he glorify Christ? Not speaking on his own authority, speaking those things which Christ gave him. And by speaking everything that Christ gave him, and in turn, the apostles speaking those things by inspiration, that glorifies God. It is impossible to glorify our Creator by being insubordinate toward His Word. If God said something and we decide it doesn't fit our role in life, it doesn't fit our opinion, it doesn't fit the things that we want to do, and we reject that Word, we can't glorify God. And so there's a very real contradiction with even the desire to have women preachers if indeed Paul, by inspiration, 
said their role was not to take authority or to teach over a man. Because what they'll claim to do is be disciples of Christ, teaching his word, bringing glory to the Father, contending for the faith. And at the same time, they're breaking the law of Christ. You cannot glorify God while not bringing glory to him at the same time. There are two sides to things always, whether following God or deciding not to follow God. The Apostle Paul wrote and spoke not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but things which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual to spiritual. They had the mind of Christ. Paul had the mind of Christ. And so as he spoke, those were Christ's words. Notice that in more detail in the 15th chapter of John in verse 15. He says, No longer do I call you servants, for servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Why? For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name he will give you. These things I commanded you, that you love one another. Notice here, I want to stress these next few verses. If the world hates you, he's saying to the apostles, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why? Because it hated Christ first. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And so that mantra of love, 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 only love that individuals will teach and teach and teach and harp on in every sermon that they preach, leaving everything else out, actually not fully understanding the love of God, which is to keep his commandments. Not a romanticized affection as we see portrayed in the world. What they're indeed doing is rejecting Paul's teaching and therefore rejecting Christ. They're hating Paul for being a misogynist and turn they're hating Christ. If they received Christ's words, they'll receive the apostles' words. So if they reject the apostles' words, they reject Christ's words. We need to understand the inspiration of the scriptures. That all things apply. All things are from Christ within those pages. He told the apostles, specifically Peter, there as he spoke in Matthew 16, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Not that they're doing the binding or the loosing, but it's already been done in eternity by their Creator. And what they speak is only that which God tells them to speak. Not leaving it up to their discovering such a truth, but it being revealed directly to them. And if we cannot use one part of his writing because it contradicts our lifestyle, contradicts society, then we've got to do away with the whole thing. We can't pick and choose. And it is interesting that many will choose parts of his writing to argue the point for women preachers instead of the writing that he talked about with regard to their role. You can't choose one or the other. You have to choose all of his teaching or none of his teaching. And then they'll ask, is this teaching relevant? We understand, okay, it's inspired now, but I'm going to argue the point that the Apostle Paul, an inspired man, was teaching these things not because... It is a foundation of creation, but because that society, that culture, the times in which Paul lived in the first century suggested this was a woman's role. But these things established in the beginning, as we'll allude to very shortly, are in fact inspired of God. They are from his breath, and that's what inspired means, the breath of God. It is as if he was speaking and you can feel his breath. That's Scripture. And Scripture is inspired and it is profitable. And it is the only thing that will thoroughly equip a man of God to every good work. Not some of it, but all of it. In Jude, the third verse, Jude talked about this Scripture. And he said that this 
faith was once for all delivered to the saints. It has been delivered. God has spoken, Hebrews chapter 1. And he is not speaking again, changing his mind on the subject. The culture is not affecting it in such a way that it literally changes what the truth of God is on any matter. Individuals are merely rejecting it. The book of Hebrews is written to individuals who, although they had known Christ and had been enlightened and partaken of those graces of God given in the gospel and obedience to it by persecution, were turning back to the old ways under the old law, being affected by Judaizers, Individuals who wanted to cause them harm. And so there was a confusion there that played in their lives. And the Hebrew writer says in the 13th chapter that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning, when you receive that gospel, just like he said in Galatians, the first chapter, Paul said, rather, when he taught them that truth and they understood it to be the truth, he is inspired and in what he's teaching is something as the Bereans saw was in accord with God's holy inspired will. That it's not going to change. Someone may bring something different, but it doesn't change. Jesus stays the same. His doctrine stays the same. And the very next verse he says, Therefore do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. There's a real problem with some Christians who let themselves doubt themselves what they've already learned, what they've known to be true, what they've discovered themselves within the Scripture, searching the Scripture, showing that these things are of God and this is the truth on the matter. An individual comes trying to deceive them. And they let themselves be deceived. We cannot do this on this matter. Society may change and it may not be the norm. And individuals may think that we're out of our minds with regard to this. But God has established this, settled it, and once for all delivered it to the saints. Romans, the 12th chapter, and in verse 2, says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect, complete, and infallible will of God. Do not add to or take away. Culture should not change what we think about our Creator. That should be established and settled in His Word, which He gave to us so that we might know Him. And so individuals will suggest giving another argument that we touched on very briefly at the beginning of the lesson. They'll make a point that, in fact, is not argued by us. That men and women are equal. We see that in Scripture with regard to this facet of salvation and of having this soul and this hope. And Christ died for all men. That's including mankind. And if they're equal in that capacity then they must be able to do the exact same things. And in fact, this is what I alluded to earlier. They'll appeal to Galatians, the third chapter, and in verse 26 through 29. And we know who wrote that epistle, the Apostle Paul, who also wrote that women are to keep silent in the church, not to have authority or to teach over a man. And he writes the truth there. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's not suggesting that because that is the truth, that you have the same roles given you in creation and in the church. He's saying that sex is not the determining factor on your salvation. Social status is not the determining factor of your salvation. Ethnicity. It's not the determining factor of your salvation. And in Acts 10, the 34th, the 34th verse, the Apostle Peter rightly said that in truth I perceive God shows no partiality. With regard to salvation, there is that equality with regard to being able to have that hope and that Christ died for all men and that your sex does not determine your whereabouts for eternity. But nowhere in that is there the implication of roles being equal with regard to being in the church and even in creation or society. And I actually listened before, way before I even knew I was going to pre preaching on this subject. Several years ago, I saw an entire sermon on YouTube uh, from California, the, 
liberal institutional churches of Christ, I think is the Pepperdine lectureships, and an individual taught on this subject and had this thing made up in his mind that this verse, simply this verse, Galatians 3 and verse 28, that there is neither male nor female, put an end to all dispute, even though the Apostle Paul says elsewhere that the role of women is not to be in that position of authority. You know what? That was his only verse the entire time. He did not appeal to any other scripture but Galatians 3 and verse 28. And I suggest to you that if we're going to want to know the will of God, we've got to read it all. Not just one verse. And we'll see in 1 Peter the third chapter and in verse 7, the same equality given there in instruction to husbands to dwell with your wives with understanding, given honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life. Husbands, you're in a position of authority, but your wives are not scum of the earth. They're heirs together of the grace of life. Their soul is valuable just as much as your soul is valuable, and that precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary was shed for them as well. You need to dwell with them in that capacity. But let's not forget the rest of that context in verse 1. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Let me say, why, why are we submissive to those even if they're not a Christian? He says that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And so we don't just have this relationship between a Christian woman and a Christian man, but a man and a woman. Your heirs together are the grace of life. But wives are in a submissive role in the home, in the marriage relationship. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, in verses 24 through 24. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so wives be to your husbands in everything. That doesn't fit with society. Individuals hear that, even Christians, sadly, some, hear that and turn their ears away from the truth. They don't like how God created them. They don't like the roles God created them to fill. I suggest to you that's where we're going to have the most fulfillment in our lives in the first place. That's where we're going to receive the most happiness in fulfilling our roles that God has created for us. And it goes to show the same thing in the church. That those who are members of the church of Christ, whether male or female, have that same hope. Appeal to the same Savior, the same message. But they don't have the same roles. Every elder now and then should and was in the scripture a male. A man desires the position. Deacons were to be males as well, husbands of one wife. And all preachers that are mentioned in the inspired scriptures were men. That's not by coincidence. That's by inspiration and design. We had the apostles in Stephen and Apollos, Timothy and Titus, and everyone else that can be mentioned with regard to the New Testament. Males who are filling that role. I want to look at specific passages now to look at why this is the case. In 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, we have another text given by the Apostle Paul which illustrates this concept of women being in submissive roles. And to understand this context, in verse 26, we see that it's concerning the assembly when he says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. It says, Let all things be done for edification. When you come together, in verse 23, he says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together. So we're not talking about Bible classes where some part of the congregation is in one part of the building and another part of the congregation is in another part of the building. You've got the cradle roll class to the high school class all sectioned up learning from a different teacher. That's not the assembly. We're talking about when, when men and women, all of those who are members of a local church are gathered in one place, not forsaking the assembly, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews the 10th chapter, 
That's the assembly when we all come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. And concerning that context, there were individuals with spiritual gifts as this is the context in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14. And we have listed in chapter 11 all of these spiritual gifts for the benefit of the congregation. He said, each of you has a psalm, teaching, tongue, revelation, interpretation. He says, though, let all things be done for edification. You all have something to bring, but now there's a cacophony of noise. One person saying one thing, one person saying another thing. You've got someone in front of you and behind you, one in the right ear, one in the left ear, all speaking truth, spiritual gifts. But how can you understand all of that? How can you digest all of that? He addresses that problem in verse 31. He says, you can all prophesy, notice, one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Notice, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In verse 40, he concludes saying, let all things be done decently and in order. Don't speak out of term. That's not helpful. That doesn't edify. One at a time. And that was a problem he addresses. But another problem concerned women. In verse 34, he says, Let your women keep silent in the churches. So you had these individuals with spiritual gifts speaking out of turn. He says, do it one by one. With women, the problem was them speaking in churches. He says, don't speak one by one. Keep silent. There's a difference there. There's permission upon speaking individually with regard to the men who had the spiritual gifts and women are not to speak at all, for they are not permitted to speak. In verse 34, notice they are to be submissive as the law also says, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, in the assembly, when men and women all together, the local church comes together to worship our God. And he makes two points there. They're not permitted to speak as the law also says. And in chapter 11, he addresses that. In verse 3, he appeals to creation just like Jesus himself did in Matthew 19 concerning the marriage relationship. Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? Explaining that marriage relationship that had not shifted even though individuals had thought Otherwise, with regard to perhaps society or influence, and it's the same here in verse 3 of chapter 11, it says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And we notice there Christ and God who are both deity. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, but there is a different role. There is a different position in authority you are submitting to god christ is the son obeying the father and then you have man whose head is christ and notice he says every man every head of man is christ and thus implied we understand that the head of every woman is man not just some not just in the husband and wife relationship there is that concept in creation that the head of woman is man, one that must be respected in the church. In verse 8 it says, For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Adam said in Genesis 2 and verse 23, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, not the other way around. That was the order of creation. And it was a creation in such capacity, in such order, because the Lord, as we mentioned before, said it is not good that man should be alone. And so woman was taken out of man for man, not the other way around. That does not demean women. If anything, it shows their value. Women are needed. Women are valuable to the man and to society, the foundation of society, the home, the foundation of the church, the home. And so those roles continue of submissiveness. Going back as we draw our lesson to a close to 1 Timothy, the second chapter, Timothy, or Paul's letter to Timothy, he mentions one extra point with regard to 
You have the order of creation. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Now, do not permit that a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Notice, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, order of creation, and then a matter of transgression. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Things that happened in the beginning. The genesis of all we know. And the foundation of which we find the principles of God illustrated. Just like with regard to marriage, man was formed first, then Eve was formed woman. But then a matter of transgression. It wasn't the man who was deceived. Did man sin? Yes, he sinned. He was responsible for his choice. But Eve was there in the garden and the devil came to her, that serpent, that cunning individual, who said, God said you cannot eat from this tree. When you eat of it, you will die. But I say you will not surely die. And Eve heard from God himself that you will die in the day you eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she was deceived and therefore ate of that tree and gave to her husband and he ate as well. We understand the woman was created to be a helpmeet, not a Lord. And in that day, she did not fulfill that role of submission, but she became that Lord. And this, this defilement of that created purpose and Adam fell short in the influence that she had over him. We need to understand that this is the general rule. So someone will say that I'm not deceived in fact, that man over there to the left of me, to the right of me, he'll be deceived before I'm deceived. Maybe that's an exception, but it's not the general rule that is found in the genesis of creation. We need to submit to what God said. We need to submit what the holy inspired writers said about these things. So what can a woman do? A woman can do anything that is permitted for her to do. Anything authorized for her to do. We're not suggesting that women are useless, but that they are very helpful within their given roles. And when they try to usurp the role of authority that is given a man, there's chaos, disorder. The church will fall apart. Candlestick will be taken away. We must do all in the name of the Lord to please the Lord. So I encourage you to do that in your life. It's not with an evil heart that we talk about these things. As we've stated before, we talk about these things because God is infinitely wise. And His blueprint for creation and for the church for all things is a purpose that will not be held, withheld from Him. If we follow that line that He has drawn for us, things will be successful and we will please Him and we will have that hope of heaven. But as soon as we decide that it's not fitting to our lives to our opinions, to our values in society. That's when things crumble for us as His created individuals. We must submit to Him in all things, including the roles of man and woman. If you are here this evening not having received the Word of God before, but now having understood that the Holy Scriptures are those things which contain the power of God unto salvation, we want to show you this evening what you must do. You've heard that word. You need to believe that word. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You need to confess that faith before men and be baptized for the remission of your sins. All things are ready this evening. And if you have obeyed the gospel, but have fallen short in some sense or fashion, if there's any spiritual need that we can assist you with, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing the selected song.